we are going to have our call to worship. Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins. And heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death. So let us worship the Lord together in love. Please continue standing, and our first hymn is Because He Lives. So, with your equipment and everything like that, what else did you say you need? Courage, Courage okay. Um, is there anything else that you need? A coach. A coach? Okay, good. What about in preparation before the game or before your activity? Is there anything that you need to do? Yes. Practice, okay. So, with all that in mind, if you... If you don't have anything fueling you, what, what drives you to do that stuff? What's that? Okay, wrong, wrong drive, sorry. What, what motivates you or gives you the energy? Do you need energy? Can you, can, you, uh, can you go out and play soccer or play other sports and be really, really tired? Okay, what, what do you need then? 
Yes. Sleep. Sleep, rest. And do you also need something to fuel yourself? Okay, what's, what kind of fuel do you use? Do you use regular or unleaded? <laughs> uh, sorry, just went over your head. <laughs> okay. what, what gives you the energy to play your sports? Yes. Okay, Jesus and food, you already beat me to my next question then. <laughs> it's always the answer when you're in church. Jesus is always the answer. So, uh, But yes, food. Um, so we need physical food to give us the energy to do things. We also need a spiritual food, and that's something that she already hit on. Um, in church, we do certain things to try and get that spiritual food. And this morning, we're going to do one of those things that reminds us of where we get our spiritual food from. Um, can anybody think of what we're going to be doing today in church? If you look behind me, it might be a hint. Yes. Communion. Okay. What, what exactly is communion? What, does it, what, what do you think it is? Anybody? Do you know what we do during communion? Yeah. We celebrate Jesus? Yeah. And, and the way we do that is we take a, we take a small piece of bread and we take a, a little cup of juice. Are you not hearing me again? I'm sorry. Uh, we, take, we take a small piece of bread and we take a, a cup of juice and we, we take them into our body. And the reason we do this is because Jesus told us to do that. He's the one that, that started this whole idea of communion. And he said, when you do this, he said, remember me. And can you understand why we use bread and, and juice or, or wine to do that? Do you know why he chose those two things? Okay, because they were parts of a regular meal that they would have. Okay, at most meals they serve bread and most times they would have wine. And he took common things that the people would do on a regular basis and he used those so that we could remember him and what he's done. When we take the bread, Jesus says, take this bread because it's a reminder of my body. It's going to be broken for you on the cross. And when we drink the juice or the wine, it's a reminder to us of the blood that Jesus shed on the cross for us. And he said, when you do these things, remember what I did for you and remember why I did them for you. And he, all, he did all that stuff because he loves us. And that's what he wants us to do is whenever we take the, the bread and the cup or whenever you have a meal and you give thanks to God for it, he just wants us to remember that he died for our sins, that he loves us and he cares us for us. So does anybody want to pray for us today? You want to pray for us? Or you want me to do it? Okay. Can you bow with me? Father, we come before you. We give you thanks for these young lives. We thank you for the joy and the laughter that you bring to us through them. And Father, we pray that you would bless them. And Lord, help us in everything we do, not just when we eat, but in everything we do to remember you, to remember the sacrifice you made for us of giving of your body and your blood so that we could be saved and forgiven of our sins. And we pray this all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. You guys are dismissed.
hymn of preparation, Breathe on Me, Breath of God, page 259 in your, court, in your books. Now you may be seated. Good morning, church. Our scripture reading today is from the book of James. We'll be reading chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind, any kind come our way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. And this is the word of our Lord. God. Well, good morning again. Will you bow with me before we, before we open? Father, we come before you. Uh, we come before you, the author and perfecter of our faith. We come to you as our God and our King. And as we break your word this morning, Lord, we just pray that that you would speak, that these would be your words, and that you would be glorified in this. I thank you, I praise you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, um, most of you know that I'm uh, back in college again uh, at the age of 54, and trying to work through becoming a preacher, pastor, I'm not sure what, i um, still waiting for, for Gene Snyder to continue telling me where I'm going with this. Uh, but uh, anyway, one of the first things that I learned in going back to school uh, is that as we dig into Scripture, we need to look at the context. We need to understand what, uh, what is being said. We need to, to do some things and observe some things. Uh, we need to ask questions of who, what, where, when, why. Um, and in doing this, I've realized this is a big reason why I fought this calling for so long is because I did not like English. I don't like asking the who, what, where, when, why questions. I like things simple and very, not necessarily precise, but just easy. Um, keep it simple, like me. Uh, so getting... Getting back to the Bible and, and understanding it correctly, we need that basic information. Um, I know I, for one, for a long time, I just assumed that the Bible was something that was written to me by God, and I could just take it, read it, and apply it, and move on. Uh, but that's not the case. The Bible wasn't written to us. Uh, that was hard for me to accept. Um, but it's not. The Bible was written thousands of years ago to other people but we can take it and apply it to our lives today if we look back at the context in which it was written. Uh, so asking those questions, who, what, where, when, and why, if we, we ask the first question of who, who wrote this? Uh, we get that from the name of the book. It's written by James. But this is not James uh, who was the disciple of Jesus. This is not uh, James and John. This is James, Jesus' brother, um, his half-brother. And 
we, we get that information from the, from the title of the book and also from the first verse of the book. Um, he, if, if you remember back, Jesus' brothers didn't necessarily think that Jesus was God's son. In fact, they thought he was a little bit crazy, and they encouraged him to stop his ministry. Uh, they tried to, to, to pull him back home and, and talk some sense into him, uh, but thankfully they were obviously wrong and didn't, didn't succeed in that. Um, but after Christ's ascension, after he was crucified, dead, raised, and then raised up with God again 40 days later, we find uh, James being listed with the brothers of Jesus as meeting with the early disciples um, in the church. In, in Acts one fourteen, we see them meeting with the disciples as the early church was being formed. So somewhere between his death or early in his ministry and this time after he has been resurrected, James definitely comes to a faith in him and realizes that he is indeed the son of god james is also mentioned in first corinthians 15 7 as having seen the risen christ personally uh, we don't have a whole lot of other information on james other than in acts 15 he is shown to be one of the leaders of the early church uh, the other who that we have to look at in this is who is he writing to uh, and if I had included verse 1 in the text as I should have, uh, we would see that it is written to the 12 tribes, the Jewish believers scattered abroad. So James is writing to Jewish Christians. Uh, but as we answer the question of when, we also find out that James wrote this letter in approximately A.D. 45 to 49. Now, there was a council that was held um, in the Jerusalem church around A.D. 50 where it was established that God's word, the gospel, should go out not just to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles, to the people who are not Jewish. Um, so if we put this in context, although James wrote this to, to the 12 tribes or to Jewish Christians, we can take this and we can apply this to all Christians everywhere. Um, and when we get to the questions of what and why, we kind of see these questions answered throughout the text, so we'll, we'll address them as we go. Um, and that's one of the things that I like about James. This is a very practical letter. There's not a lot of deep theology in this. You don't have to do a lot of digging. So for this reason, James is one of my favorite books and the reason that I start at, started out um, preaching from here. Uh, another reason is it's short. It's only five chapters. And in those chapters, in those five chapters, James doesn't beat around the bush. Those of you who know me on a personal level know that I am not very talkative. Uh, conversation is not one of my strong characteristics. Uh, so I like James. He gets to the point, he makes his point, and he moves on, and he gets things done. Uh, and in this book, he doesn't waste any time. He has one verse of an introduction, and then he starts out, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for joy. Now, upon first reading this, it sounds like an oxymoron. Nobody does this, okay? Who in their right mind thinks of troubles as a reason for joy? I mean, how many of us driving down the highway get a flat tire during rush hour tra traffic and you're late for an appointment and you think, yes, this is awesome. I need to call all my friends and let's celebrate. Nobody does this, okay? So I started looking at this, and I thought, well, maybe my translation's off a little bit. Maybe the guy that was working on the New Living Translation was a little bit like me, a little bit sarcastic. Maybe he had a fight with his wife earlier in the morning, and he just got a couple words wrong as he was translating. So I looked at another translation that, that Lancaster Bible College suggests. I looked at the English Standard Version, and it reads like this. It says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. I don't know about you, but trials and troubles kind of sound a little bit alike. So I don't see a whole lot of difference there. Um, and then I started thinking, I'm like, what would Steve Ryder do? Steve Ryder would tell us to go to the only real translation there is, the King James Version. So I looked at King James Version, and it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. Now, when I first, I got to admit, the first I preached this message for Doug a couple years ago, and when I first read this, I read Divers Temptations, and I'm like, I don't even know what Divers Temptations is. 
Um, it's basically diverse, meaning various temptations. I figured that out on Friday night around probably two in the morning as I was looking over this again, and I'm like, you are so dumb. Uh, but anyways, going back even to, to Steve's translation, it's pretty much telling us the same thing. And one of the first things that we notice in all three translations or any translation you get, it's saying consider it joy. Now, I thought maybe my idea of joy is messed up, so I looked that up. And it says that joy is a feeling of great pleasure and happiness. So I'm still not figuring out how you can look at temptations, troubles, trials, and come to a place of joy. And I think that the way that we do this is we need to go to verse 3 to put it in perspective, because James expands on that a little bit. And he says, when, uh, let, let me go back here, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Um, and I, I kind of skipped over a part there. James is also talking about the other thing that we, we get from verse 2 is James doesn't say if your faith is tested or by chance you go through some te tempting. He says when, okay? So it is assumed that we are going to go through trials, temptations, testing of some sort. And he says when we face them, face them with joy. And then in verse 3, he explains how we do that or why we do that. For when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Now, the ESV and the, the King James Version, they both say it pretty much the same way, but with a little bit different words. They use the words, instead of uh, endurance, they use the word steadfastness or patience. Um, and these are things that are going to be built in us as we endure the testing with joy. But how many of you would consider it a compliment to hear people use, the, the, use words like that to describe you when they talked about you, to say that you are steadfast or patient, or to say that you are a man or a woman of endurance, somebody who can be counted on to stick around for the long haul. Okay. Now don't raise your hands, but how many of you are there now? How many of you can say that about yourselves right now? If you're like me, you're probably not going to be in the category where you raise your hand to that. But how many of you would like to be there? Okay? James says that we get the opportunity to become that type of person when we face these trials and temptations that test our faith, and we do so with an attitude of joy. Now, we already discussed that we're going to face these troubles. There's no hiding from it. So I looked up a couple commentaries on these verses to get a little bit better perspective of what kind of trials and temptations that James is talking about to his original readers. Because obviously they weren't going to be driving down the road in rush hour traffic and get a flat tire. Um, they were facing a whole different set of trials and temptations that, that we do. And as I looked up the words that James were using, he was using words that describe the testing that relates to the purifying of precious metals. Okay? This is done by heating up metals like silver or gold so hot that they become a liquid. And when they do, the impurities in these metals rise to the top and they, they reach in with, with something to skim those impurities off, leaving behind only the pure precious metals, the pure gold, the pure silver, or whatever it is that they're being refined. Now the process for this requires intense heat. For silver, you have to take it up to over 1,700 degrees. 1700 degrees Fahrenheit. For gold, it's just shy of 2000 degrees. So the testing that James is talking about here is severe. It's not just a minor inconvenience that he's talking about. And many of James's readers in this time were Christians that were facing poverty, persecution, and even death just for the simple fact that they proclaimed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Okay? Um, you, you can see this in, in Christian history uh, in the first century Palestine or just about anywhere else that a Christian would be living back then. So to put things in perspective, the trials that James's original audience were experiencing were quite severe. Now that's not to say that your trials are not. It's just letting you know that James is not talking about minor inconveniences. He and his readers knew the difficult struggles, maybe even more so than you and I do today. But regardless of your situation or your translation of the Bible, James gives the same advice. He says, count it as joy. And he says to consider it as joy because he's looking ahead to the results of the testing. 
the perseverance that he is talking of here is not just getting through something. It is an overcoming of trials. It's a victorious completion of a difficult situation. Some of those early Christians facing the torture, death, and persecution did so singing and praising God. Multiple times we read of Paul in prison after being beaten, singing songs of worship with other prisoners. Okay? We too are to be expressing joy because of that victorious overcoming spirit, spirit that God is producing in us through the trial. Okay? This is preparing us for whatever may lie ahead so we may be even more equipped to handle the next situation. And James continues this thought in verse 4. He says, So let it grow, it being the, the endurance. Let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. So finally, wrapping up this, this section, he says, As we grow in our perseverance, we become mature. We become perfect meaning that we are fully developed and capable of achieving the tasks that God has prepared for us to do in our faith. We're also complete. Through these difficult trials, our weaknesses become strengths, and our blemishes in our character and abilities are erased. And finally, we are needing nothing. Ultimately, we become more and more like Jesus. Okay. After all, Jesus himself faced trials and temptations, whether it was in the wilderness with, with Satan or in his day-to-day -day life facing the criticism from those who did not consider him the Lord. He faced them and overcame them all the way to the cross. He faced death, not cowering in fear, but confident, strong, and victorious. He persevered through trials of many kinds. He faced rejection, ridicule, beatings, and torture, and even death. And he did all this with one goal in mind, you. He did it to pay the debt of your sins and mine. The Bible says that we are forgiven and freed of all our sins and guilt if we simply and truly believe in him as our Lord and Savior. And by doing this, we are given right standing with God. We're adopted into his family as sons and daughters. And that's why in verse 2, James addresses his readers as brothers and sisters. He's speaking to Christians, to those who through faith in Jesus Christ have become adopted into his family through faith as God's children. Now, if you're not already part of God's family, or if you're unsure of whether you are, I encourage you to talk with me or someone that you know who is a follower of Jesus about making a decision to become a follower of Jesus. It's not going to prevent you from having troubles. I guarantee you that. In fact, you're probably going to notice more troubles. But it will help you to face them not alone, not on your own. Okay? Speaking of problems, how many of you would like to have responded to a difficult situation in a way that glorifies God rather than in a way that requires an apology later on? If we had better developed our patience, we might be able to look back with a little less regret, regret. How many of you have felt like giving up when time after time you've run into opposition to your plans or a challenge that you didn't expect? Wouldn't it be great if we had the perseverance and endurance to push forward with a steadfast attitude? We could accomplish so much more than sitting around and having a pity party for ourselves because nothing goes our way. You see, when we allow God to work in us and develop a trust in Him and not in our own abilities and power, we can start becoming the people that James is telling us to be. Now, obviously, this doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen after a few tests. It happens during a lifetime of development of these qualities. And if this isn't the goal for every one of us, it should be. We all have room to grow in this, we all have op and we will all have opportunities in the coming week to grow, probably most of us even today. Parents, your children are going to disobey you. Husbands and wives, you're probably going to hear something from your spouse that's going to offend you. It's just the way it is. We do this. Um, there's going to be delays in your travels, conflicts at work. There's going to be appliances that are going to break, budgets that are going to be stretched beyond their limits. Your health may fail, and sadly enough, loved ones may die. I don't know what you're going to face, but one thing is for sure. You're going to be tested. 
Okay? As followers of Christ, James is telling you to be different than the rest of the world when this happens. Your attitude should be different because of what God is doing in you as you go through this life. He says to be joyful, not because of the trial, but because of what's going on inside you as you learn to persevere. Paul echoes this in his first letter to the Thessalonians. He gives a bit of insight as to how to do it. In chapter 5, verses 16 to 18, he says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who are in Christ Jesus. So Paul continues this attitude of choosing joy. I've found it again in 1 Peter. He's also saying that. They're saying, choose joy. Paul says it, rejoice always. We should be lifting up praise and thanks to God in every situation we face, whether the results are enjoyable or unenjoyable. Uh, In order to do that, you need to be connected to God. So you need to pray continually. He He says, tell him your problems, and then listen. Let him guide you through them, rather than trying to handle everything on your own. Stop and listen. And then give thanks, okay? If your problems don't get solved right away, take time to recount the many trials that God has already brought you through. Remembering God's faithfulness is a huge boost to your ability to be joyful and thankful. As I was getting ready, or as as I agreed to do this message this week, um, I went to work that night, and I just started thinking of all the things that could go wrong. I started thinking of how... Something I'm going to say is going to make somebody mad. I'm going to get rejected, and nobody's going to like me. And it got to the point that night I was starting to have chest pains, and I thought, you are so ridiculous. You are sitting here worrying about something that, you know, God's already brought you through. And I started, I knew the passage I was using, and I've already preached on it, so I should know this message, but I'm still standing there at work worrying about what's going to happen. Uh, So the way that I started battling that is started to remind myself, look, you've done this before. God's already helped you to do this, and he's going to help you do it again. So quit worrying, quit being stupid, and just do it and suck it up. So remember, these aren't traits that are qualities that we're just going to read about or we're going to watch a video about or follow a 12-step patient or 12-step program and become patient or develop endurance. I got one more story, and then we'll finish this up. Uh, A lot of you know that I was a wrestling coach for about 10 years. Um, And in that time, I've watched a lot of young men come into the program. Um, They either watched wrestling on TV or YouTube, or they had a friend that was doing it, and they decided they wanted to become a wrestler. So they would come to practice, and as coaches, we would demonstrate a few basic moves to try and teach them Usually the first thing we would teach them is a takedown. But just some basic moves to try and get your opponent onto the mat. And we would show them how to do it, and then we would work with them and let them do this with another partner who would work with them and allow them to do the moves so that they could develop the muscle memory and get an idea of what it would feel like to do that. We would practice this over and over, and then eventually we would have them scrimmage. Now what a scrimmage is, is they would start practicing with, with an opponent, and while they're doing this, instead of the opponent just letting them do the move, the opponent's trying to do the move to them too. Now, in this, there, there becomes some resistance. Uh, there is some struggle between the two, and there is testing of the abilities that we tried to teach them. Now, as they, as they face this testing, a lot of times they realize that they can't do this. They fail. Uh, So they go back and they practice over and over. This challenge is usually between friends or at least classmates who are going to over time help each other to improve and be able to do the moves. Now the process is repeated days and weeks on end until they face the ultimate challenge of wrestling an opponent from another school. Now this opponent has no intentions of letting them succeed because their intention is to do it to them. Um, That is when these young men discover whether they have really developed their abilities to succeed in wrestling or not. Usually to become successful, it takes years of practices and many, many failures along the way. So why am I telling you this? Because I see huge similarities in wrestling and in our lives as Christians. 
We all, as, as a young man coming to, to become a wrestler, they have an, a desire to aspire to win a medal or a trophy as a symbol of victory. As Christians, we want to develop the God-honoring life that one day we can be proud of as we stand before our God in judgment. And he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Um, so we want to develop patience. We want to develop persistence, steadfastness, and endurance. But just like becoming a wrestler, those things don't develop without years of testing and trials to prove them out. And just like a young boy that becomes a wrestler, as he grows in age, the tests and trials that he faces grow increasingly more difficult. The same happens for us as Christians. As we grow in our faith, the tests are going to become more and more difficult. But we've got to stay focused on the end result. Okay, so I want to read that last verse one more time from the New International Version. It says, Let perseverance finish its work so that you may become mature and complete, lacking nothing. Our goal is to become mature, complete, and lacking nothing, just like Jesus. Will you bow and pray with me? Almighty God, we do give you thanks and we give you praise for the work that you are doing in our lives through the various testing and trials we face each day. Father, we ask that you go forth with us from this place of worship. We ask that you guide us and strengthen us so that no matter what we face in the future, we do so with joy. Not because we enjoy the trial, but because we know that you are working in us, making us more like your Son and our Savior, Jesus. And Father, if there is anyone here today who does not know Jesus as their personal Savior, I ask you to open their mind and their heart so that they can believe in him and know for certain that their eternity is, is secure and guaranteed in heaven with you. I thank you for hearing this prayer, for being with us, and I thank you in Jesus' holy name that we pray. Amen.